everybody. Welcome. My name is Mark Hillier and I'm a master here on the Arcanum. And this afternoon we're going to have a, uh, a cohort tutorial and it is a introduction to infrared. And uh, I am uh, truly an evil person when it comes to infrared because I like um, to addict everybody within reach uh, to the infrared uh, technologies and photography. Um, I have been doing infrared photography for, oh my goodness, 40 years? Yeah, 40 years. And one of my last projects at, project at Eastman Kodak before I retired was to automate uh, the, the T-grain salt growth facility and the infrared salt growth facility uh, for the emulsion and coating of uh, tea grain and infrared films. So um, I do shoot both digital and film infrared. I enjoy both. I shoot more digital than I do film because there's way more things that you can do with it. Uh, so with that, I'm going to share my desktop, and we'll just jump right into it. So here we go. And uh, what I'm going to do at the beginning is I'm going to give you guys a preset slideshow um, on infrared photography. It's called Seeing and Understanding Infrared Photography, and it's basically an um, introduction uh, for people that don't know anything about infrared. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. Oh, by the way, this is my chop. And for those of you who don't use a chop, artists typically use these to mark or sign the back of their work. And this particular chop says fine art. Okay. Um, infrared. Um, is a way to create wonderfully ethereal images. Um, but what it's about is looking at the world with different eyes. Um, our eyes cannot perceive infrared energy. Um, and the images that the camera will capture are off-worldly, almost alien sometimes. Yet they're full of wonder and beauty all of their own. It's also about looking with a new perspective, um, looking at the same old scenes that we shoot in color, but with an eye towards infrared. Um, the things that we will compare in color and infrared are so far apart, yet they can be the same image that it will just blow your mind. Um, and lastly, looking at the world with new colors. Infrared is set into two distinct areas, black and white infrared and faux color infrared. Faux color is false color. And um, Kodak did several color infrared films, um, uh, an aerial infrared film that generated wild colors that were beyond belief. And you would look at them and you'd go, oh my goodness, how did you get that image? So normal scenes that we look at when we shoot in faux color um, are just amazingly different. Uh, it's easy to get sucked into them really, really fast. And depending upon how you shoot, you can get different color ranges uh, um, by choosing different, different infrared filters to place upon your camera. But having said that, infrared is the study and capture of near-infrared light energy. Um, near means deep red. Okay, I'm going to show you that on a chart. The type of photography that we do in infrared does not show heat. Um, there are special cameras that will capture heat-related infrared scenes, um, but with our film and our cameras, we're not getting up that high in nanometers, and I'll explain to you all what that means later on. 
Normal photography contains all elements of the physical uh, the visible spectrum, including a little bit of infrared image. Uh, normally, most digital cameras filter out 99% of this energy and let you concentrate on the visible spectrum. How it does this is they place a filter over the sensor called a hot mirror. And the hot mirror blocks ultraviolet light and infrared light. So it lets the light in the center between those two um, actually strike the sensor to record the image. And that is the normal visible spectrum that our eyes are capable of seeing. Um, when we photograph in infrared, we're looking to capture light energy in the deep red end, as I stated a minute ago. Some cameras can do heat, but ours will not. Now, warmer objects tend to show up as white, and cooler objects will show up as black. But infrared can fool you just a little bit, too. Certain chemicals will reflect more infrared energy than color. Things like um, green leaves, anything that has chlorophyll in it, um, will act as though they're warm subjects, but what they're really doing is they're reflecting more infrared. Now this black infrared image, black and white, you can see an example of that, how these green leaves are showing up as white. Okay, and that is because the chlorophyll reflects infrared energy and absorbs normal visible color spectrum energy. Okay, now this is a chart of what our eyes, the human eye, can see. It starts at about 350 nanometers and goes up to right at about 700 nanometer. Now, what in blue blazes is a nanometer? A nanometer is a mathematical way of describing light energy according to the frequency. Now, you all have um, 110, 115 volt AC uh, electricity going through your house. And that's done as a sine wave. It oscillates up and down and back up and down and back up. The measurement between the peaks of one wave is the measurement of the frequency. And light energy is so, so small. And the waves are so close together that we have to measure them in nanometers, okay? Um, and that's just how we describe the various filters in nanometers, but we'll do a little bit more on that a little later. What our eyes can see, as I said, starts at about 350 nanometers. This is the deep blue and violet, okay? And it ends around 700 nanometers, which is dark, dark red. And this explains how the different rods and cones see different frequencies. Uh, but this is the visible spectrum, what our eyes are capable of seeing. All you need to remember is it starts around 350 and goes to 700. Now, what our camera is capable of seeing any digital camera is capable of seeing is this. Now, notice that this is the visible uh, spectrum here that our eyes can see. Uh, this little color chart shows you the beginning and the end. And the camera, without any type of filter on the sensor, can go all the way down to 300 nanometers, which is into the ultraviolet. Oops, I'm going to go back. Ultraviolet. And it will go all the way up and drop off, starting at about 900 nanometers, uh, down to 1,000. Okay? And this is at about 800. This is your deep, high contrast black and white. Uh, but all CCD and CMOS sensors are capable of seeing this range of frequencies. 
Now remember I told you that we put a hot mirror on top of the sensor to block out all of this filters out everything from 350 up and below and 700 and above. Okay. Now let's talk about the benefits of shooting in infrared. Obviously it's a different viewpoint on the world around us. Everything that we normally see during the day in color looks very different in infrared. The best time for shooting infrared, believe it or not, is in midday and high contrast light. You know, when the sun's directly overhead and it's so bright and contrasty that you can't really get a good color image, this is the best time to shoot infrared. It loves that. Infrared can shoot both black and white in color. Um, and it will generate stunning ethereal images, as I'll show you. Um, it's good in bright sky, dark sky, bad sky, rain, snow, it doesn't matter. Infrared works well in all situations. You've all had those days when we go out with the camera and we have just a gray sky, a solid layer of gray clouds or mist above us that makes any color image just look terrible. Well, if you were to get your infrared camera out and shoot that scene, infrared will um, go through that uh, layer of clouds, that, that stark grayness, and bring out structure that your eyes are incapable of seeing. Okay? These are all examples of infrared. Um, this was done deep, deep, heavy snow. Okay? Um, coastal scenes, scenes in the mountains. Um, it all is good. Now, you can do infrared on the cheap. Um, your digital camera has what's known as a hot mirror glued on top of the sensor that blocks infrared and ultraviolet. But it leaks a little bit. So if you wanted to, you could go out and buy a 720 nanometer infrared filter and put on your lens um, and take an infrared picture, a landscape. You have to pre-focus, all right, because your camera is not going to see through that filter. And the exposures are going to be long, uh, 20, 30 seconds, a minute. Um, but you can still get some wonderful in infrared images just playing with it this way. If you want to decide if you like infrared shooting, this is a good way. Unfortunately, a 720 nanometer filter um, is very expensive, being about $100 for a 58 millimeter one, all the way up to 200 for 77. Now, if we're going to do a conversion, Okay, we're going to talk about that. Um, converted IR cameras will allow handheld photography with normal exposure times. It's just like your color system. And choosing one of them uh, is the very best option for shooting infrared uh, rather than doing it with a filter on a color system. Um, some people convert cameras on their own. It's not that hard. But there's a problem in that dust can get between the sensor and the infrared filter that you have to put on top of the sensor. It's best done in a clean room environment. So you're really money ahead if you pay somebody in a clean room to do this for you. All right. Um, different cameras will give you different results. Um, but they will all work for infrared, DSLRs, point and shoots, and mirrorless. Mirrorless are my favorites, and I'm going to explain to you why shortly. But if you have an old point and shoot laying around, you don't know what to do with, you can send it off. 
and have it converted to any of the infrared uh, bands. And it's a good way to start. Whereas if you convert it to DSLR, it's another big old heavy camera to carry around with you in the field. And pretty soon you get tired of all that weight and quit. Okay, now let's talk about mirrorless and the micro four thirds. Um, these make great infrared systems. And the reason is, is they're 100% full time live view. Okay. Um, they all have interchangeable lenses. They're lightweight. Um, you can get them between 16 and 24 megapixels. Uh, they offer full-size DSLR functionality, including raw image files, image stabilization, and more. And the nice thing about it is there's no mirror uh, to flop up and down like the DSLR uses. So the sensor is seeing the image all the time. So even if you do one of the other conversions that require you to have a filter on the lens that would stop your viewfinder and a DSLR from operating, the mirrorless and the micro four thirds will always work very well. And I've had every single Olympus and Panasonic Micro Four Thirds that they've made converted to infrared. And I can tell you which ones work well and which ones don't. Um, this is just uh, the picture that we've been showing here. It's, it's, this is a CMOS digital sensor. It's found inside most camera systems. Now you notice this rose colored? This is the ultraviolet and UV blocking filter called the hot mirror that keeps the IR and the UV out. When you have a conversion done, this hot mirror is physically, surgically removed. Um, it's pried off. It's ground off. Um, they do lots of various things to get that hot mirror off, which is why you want that clean room environment to do this type of work. All right, let's talk about the types of conversions. There are three, full spectrum, dual spectrum, and a dedicated conversion. Okay. A full spectrum infrared conversion is a camera conversion where the hot mirror is removed and it's replaced by a clear piece of glass. This allows all light UV, normal color, and infrared to pass through and reach the sensor. You program the camera into the infrared band that you want to shoot. We'll talk about those. Want to shoot? We'll talk about those in a few minutes by buying and putting the proper filter on the end of your lens. So that puts the filter in your image path for a DSLR. So this is only suitable for cameras with electronic viewfinder, like the mirrorless ones, um, or a DSLR with a live view. If your camera has a live view, you can do this. Your viewfinder stops functioning, but the live view will enable you to work and capture infrared. This conversion will also allow you to shoot ultraviolet images if you buy an ultraviolet filter. And more importantly, you can convert the camera back to normal color by buying an external hot mirror and putting it on your lens. B plus W makes one called the 486 that works very, very good. So that gives you the ability to have an infrared camera that you can program with filters yet allows you to convert it back to color as a backup or standby body. The second is dual spectrum. It's almost the same as the full spectrum. They, instead of a piece of clear glass, they put an ultraviolet filter on the sensor that blocks ultraviolet. Now, everything else works the same as the, dual, as the full spectrum, but you can't do UV work. You still program it with an external filter, and you can still convert it back into color with the hot mirror filter on the end of the lens. This is the um, 
conversion that I use more often than not, the dual spectrum conversion. And lastly, the dedicated infrared conversion. Now this is pretty much what most everybody else uses. The hot mirror is removed and replaced with a specific infrared band filter. This is only infrared. You cannot convert this back into color. But if you got a 590 nanometer, I know I haven't explained that yet, I'm going to. You can put external filters on it and convert it to a higher bandwidth. So you can go 590, 630, 665, 720, 800, and 850. You can go up in numbers, but you can't go down below whatever it is you have put on your in front of your sensor. Now, if you're going to change the band with an external filter, again, it requires a live view or a mirrorless camera to do this. Otherwise, you cannot see through the, the viewfinder. Okay? Here are the choices. Currently on the market, we have nuts, what's known as super blue, um, in-camera false color. Instead of having to do your false color work in post-processing, it does it in the camera. It does great false color. It does really poor black and white. 590 is super color or the Goldie filter. It's very, very popular because it does super false color images and it does good black and whites. This is kind of the catch-all uh, infrared conversion. 630 is, is pinky. Um, it does false color shifted more towards the pinks and yellows and away from the golds. 665 is enhanced. This is full pink. Um, pinks and reds. Uh, it does great false color and good black and white. Okay. Now the higher we go in the nanometers, the better the black and white becomes. Okay. Then we have 720 nanometers. This is what is known as standard IR. This is what most cameras are uh, converted to. Uh, it does really, really super great black and whites. All right. And it does a little bit of uh, false color, but you don't get a lot of colors through 720, but you can still get some. 800 to 850 nanometers, these are the high contrast, deep black and white only. This sees no color. Now with this one, you're going to lose two or three stops of light. The camera's going to be a little slower, but it's still okay. And you can go up to 1,000, but nobody goes up to 1,000 because it becomes uh, a camera that you can only shoot on a tripod. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we are going to take a small break and I'm going to ask you um, if you have any questions to this point. We're going to go back into the, the presentation. Questions, comments? Yes, no? So you think if you're going to convert um, a camera 590 might be the best option because then you can always add a filter on the front to get the higher. Yes, provided you have live view or it's a mirrorless camera. Okay. Because um, right now I'm using an R72 filter. Is that equivalent to the 720? That is the 720. That, okay. that is a filter from Hoya. Yeah. And okay. That is one of the better 720 nanometers. Yeah. And you're using that on a color camera, right? Yeah, my D300. Yes, yeah, so you're getting long exposure times, and you can't see through the viewfinder, but you have a live view, so that works. Yeah. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Um, what what uh, Olympus or Fuji um, mirrorless compact body, uh, affordable body, would you recommend? Um, well, for the Fujis, mm -hmm. uh, if, if money was no object, I would say the X-T1. <clears throat> In fact, Fuji, and they may have already come out with it, is they're, they're going to sell 
a XT1 already converted to full spectrum. Oh, wow. Okay, straight from the factory. And when you buy it, um, then you just have to buy the filters. Now, the thing about the filters are the darker the filter, the more expensive it is. So like all of the 590s, this uh, 630, the 665, those are very cheap filters. They're about 20 five to thirty dollars a piece as you know the 720 you're, you're talking about a hundred mm -hmm. um, Singray has a one that's rated at 720 but it's really not it's up around 790 and uh, it, it does wonderful black and whites and it's it's about a hundred and fifty um, B plus W makes one called the 093, which is 850 nanometers, which is deep black, high contrast infrared. Um, now there is a new company on eBay that's making a variable infrared filter, like the variable ND filters that you see. And it goes 500 up to about 700 in 80, 790 nanometers. It shifts the color a little bit, uh, but it's still very useful. It gives you the option of having one filter and you just dial it in by turning it. Okay. And what about Olympus? Oh, the Olympus. Um, well, um, no. Mm, <laughs> um, the Panasonics, the GH2, the GH3, the GH4, um, I, I found that they worked a little bit better than the Olympuses. Okay. Uh, but the EP1 and the EP2 from Olympus, um, I've had those converted. Hmm. Um, the OMB is a, is a really wonderful body. Okay, the M5, the OMB M5. Um, and that would make a great infrared body too. Okay, because it's going to give you less noise. Mm -hmm. uh, the cheap cameras tend to, when you shoot above ISO 100, to be very noisy and infrared. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay? Yep. All right. Any other questions, or should we move on? Yeah, I have one question. So if you get it converted to a 590, you still have to put a filter on the front if you want to do a 720 nanometer. Yes. Um, and that's still going to be the same darkness, like the same. Um, you know how the 720 is pretty dark of a filter. Um, so then I would still have to use a tripod. No, okay. not at all. The only reason you would have to use a tripod is if you had the hot mirror in place on the camera sensor. Okay. Okay. The 720. Um, the 590, if you did 590, it stops everything below 590, but allows everything above 590 through. Okay. So if you put a 720 on it, the 590 is still going to let all of that through as though it's clear. Okay. Okay? So it's still a walk-around handheld camera. So then would it be a different than the seven, R72 that you put on the front? No, I just I just put an R72 on the front neck, converts a 590 to 720. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, I, I keep the B&W 093, which is 850 nanometers, and I'll throw that on the front, too. Okay. Okay? What do you recommend as the best way to start out? Uh, getting a, another camera and converting it to what and what filters? Okay. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I recommend starting out if you're unsure if you're going to like infrared. Knowing full well that I told you you're going to be addicted. <laughs> okay? If you have an old camera laying around your house, uh, send it out and have it converted. Um, and I would have it converted to either 590 or 720. Which one would you say do 720 and be done? I, I would go with the 720 because it gives you a little bit of color, but it gives you absolutely brilliant black and whites. Okay, so for someone who likes film black and white, that's the better way to go. Okay. Now, I don't like color converted to black and white as much as I like the contrasty film. Okay. film. 
Um, well, then that now, what kind of camera would you convert? Um, a 5D2 camera. Okay. Then what I would suggest to you is don't even do 720. Go right up to 800. But then I get no color. Yeah, but you don't like color. <laughs> I'm just saying that I might want a little color. Yeah, but you're not going to get a lot at 720. You're going to get some. Well, I'm looking at some of the shots that have the trees with some of the white and all of that, and a little bit of the green kind of gets orangey looking. Yes. Okay, well, what if I decide I'm in one of those moves that I can't shoot that? No, if, if you do 800, you can't shoot that. So I should go 720? Yeah, you should go 720 or, or maybe one other one. Maybe go down to 665. And then get a filter for the outside of the lens I use? Yeah, if you do 665, you can convert it to 720 with an external filter or convert it to 800 with an external filter. Okay. 665 is called enhanced color. And it's going to give you just a little bit more color for um, the faux color work. Okay. Um, but yet it's still going to give you great black and white image. I'm, I'm looking for a pen so I can write it down. 665. 665 called enhanced color. Okay, and then a filter would be what? Um, a 720 and a Hoya R72. Um, if you wanted to shoot deep contrast, black and white only. So I put the 720 on the 665 conversion. And it turns it into a 720 camera. Okay. Okay, so that's the way to go. All right, and then if I want to use color, then I put the other filter on there. The, if no. I want to convert it back to, you, can't do it on a six sixty. No, the only way to convert it back to color is to do a um, a dual spectrum conversion. Or okay, which conversion am I doing? The single conversion? Yeah, you were you were talking about a dedicated single conversion, but you okay, could do that. you could do the dual spectrum conversion. What do you recommend? I do if 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 you can afford to buy the infrared filters for the for the, your lenses, then the dual spectrum conversion gives you much more creative leeway. Because you can make it be anything that you want, provided the camera has a good live view. Okay, dual, dual spectrum. And we're going to get into that more. Okay, I'll shut up now. Oh, no, you don't have to shut up. That's why I stopped the presentation was to do questions. Mark. Yes. Do the uh, filters degrade image quality at all? No, they do not. Okay. Seems to me, if, I don't know, you would start out with something like a uh, the deep blue conversion and then just by the various filters to add on so you could just move up through. No, you can't do that. Okay. Um, the the deep blue called super blue. That's a very specialized tri-band filter. It lets a little bit of ultraviolet in. It lets a little bit of uh, visible in, and it lets a little bit of um, infrared in. And if you were to throw an infrared filter on that, uh, the, the super blue would block it. Okay. But then you could also go like five. five. Yeah, and then you could buy the filters and just work your way up to whatever you wanted. Provided you have a good live view or a mirrorless system. Sure. Okay. The mirrorless system, if you're going to buy a camera, is the best way to go for an infrared camera. Okay. And if, if one of the things you want to do is have the camera be a backup color camera, then instead of doing a 590, do a dual spectrum. Okay. And then you, with the, with the addition of a, um, a B plus W um, hot mirror filter, uh, the 486, you can make that camera a color camera again. What's the uh, lowest limb wavelength on the uh, dual conversion? Uh, you can go down to right at ultraviolet. Uh, okay. So you, you you can go you can go right that back down into color into visible color all the way up through all of the infrared bands. Okay. You, right. cannot, you cannot do ultraviolet. If you want to do ultraviolet, 
then you have to do a full spectrum conversion. Um, but in all honesty, I've had several full spectrums, and aside from playing with ultraviolet um, uh, for my blog and for educational purposes, I never used it. Okay. Now, if you want to do in-camera false color with the um, the super blue filter, mm -hmm. that requires a full spectrum conversion because the dual spectrum conversion blocks ultraviolet. Okay. And the um, uh, the super blue requires ultraviolet to do in-camera false color. Okay. Very good. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, we'll, we'll jump back into it. Let me uh, share my screen again. And what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about all of these conversions or all of the choices with dual spectrum or full spectrum. The first was the super blue. Uh, this is in-camera false color, gold plant tonality, nice blue sky, but terrible black and white. This can only be used as a dedicated conversion or on a dual or no oh see that's wrong it has to be a full spectrum not a dual spectrum it can only be used on a full spectrum conversion with an O47B filter so I have to repair that okay you guys are helping me proofread this now it's a little funky to use. You have to white balance it differently than you do color and differently than you white balance infrared. Um, for a white balance on a super blue, you have to do a custom white balance on the blue sky. Um, you can also try it on the, the green grass. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't but it does require a custom white balance. This is right out of the camera. This has no post-processing in it whatsoever. Okay? Then we go into the 590. This is called Goldie or Super Color, depending on who you have do the conversion. Wonderful gold tone plant tonality. Um, it does golds and yellows. It gives a deep blue sky, and it does okay black and white. Okay, this is the conversion that most people use. And you have to admit, it is a wonderful image. It really is. Okay, it does pretty good black and whites too. Okay, 665, enhanced color. As I said, with this one, we shift from golds and yellows into the pinks and the reds. We still get great blue skies, blue water. Okay, um, a lot of people like this conversion because it lets them do um, really nice color work. And it gives uh, a better black and white, too. There's the same image in black and white. Okay, it works. 720 nanometers. This is the standard infrared filter. You get some color, uh, but they're muted. Uh, this gives you the darkest blue sky, and this gives super, super good black and white. Okay, now depending upon your camera and the thickness of the 720 nanometer filter they put on the sensor, some conversions will give you more color than others because there's light leakage. Some cameras require a very thin filter over the sensor, so the conversion companies 
are going to do the 720, but it's going to allow a little bit more light leakage, so you're going to get a little bit more color. Okay. Um, if you put a 720, the Hoya R72 filter, you're not going to get near this amount of color. Okay. But the black and whites, oh, yeah. Now, notice that we're starting to get white blooms at 720. Not just white, but we're getting these this ethereal bloom. Of, uh, the, the white leaves turn uh, very soft. This is a famous effect called the wood effect. And this was first discovered with film infrared back in, in the early ages of photography. And for the black and white infrared shooters, this is something that they strive for. The higher in nanometers you go, 720 and higher, the better the bloom on the white leaves. Okay? Now, 800 to 850, these are super high contrast, deep contrast black and whites. No color, although because you are shooting on an RGB color camera, um, it's not going to come out perfect black and white is going to come out muddy black and white, like a black and white print on a color printer without black inks. So you're still going to have to run them through a, a true black and white converter, but there's no color for full color at all. Um, it gives blue skies turn black. Um, you get just stunning clarity. I mean, look at the detail of this shrimp boat. Okay. Um, it was kind of a gray overclass sky. See how the infrared sees detail in the clouds that your eyes can't see? This is one of the reasons we shoot infrared. Look at the handprint in the window. Only infrared picked up that handprint. Okay? Uh, I call this image my wheelhouse bell. And I can only imagine what the pilot was thinking as his hand was pressed against this while he was out deep in the ocean. Um, you got to admit that the uh, 800 to 850s, this, this, is, this gives stunning black and whites. Uh, this is 850 nanometers for this shot. Okay. I love... 800 and 850 nanometers. This sits on my camera uh, in, in the terms of a filter on the lens probably 99% of the time. I very rarely put a color filter on anymore. Um, you, you can use the, the light striking the objective of the lens uh, very well to get wonderful rays of the sun. Um, the infrared energy sees deep into the cloud structure. It just gives you uh, amazing black and white work that you can't get any other way. All right, let's talk about faux color. Now, faux color is in, in digital infrared. It's a way to emulate Kodak Air Chrome infrared film. And the air chrome gave us really great and wild colors. Um, and what the film did is Kodak reversed the red and the blue channels, the red and the blue layers in the negatives. So anything that was supposed to be blue turns red, and anything that was supposed to be red turns blue in the negative. Well, we can do the same thing uh, with our 590 we simply swap the red and blue channels and then set the blue to red and the red to blue. I actually have a Photoshop action on my blog that you can download that automates this for you in a very intelligent fashion. Uh, this is the hardest part to false color infrared is getting this done right so that the sky isn't um, an aqua color. Uh, the skies tend to turn blue-green, and there's a very simple fix for that, and this uh, action will do that for you. But as you can see, w w we get good color, and we get good black and white. All right. 
Now, let's talk about subjects. What can you expect your subject matter? What impact can you expect of it on your infrared images? Warmer things like leaves, clouds, against a cold sky, people, and wood object have a tendency to photograph white in infrared. Colder items tend to shift to black, and that includes water, blue skies, tree trunks, and metal objects, okay? Living things other than plants, and except for some people, we're going to come back to that, they come across as lifeless. The infrared does not work for bird and nature photography. It just doesn't work. Um, as a photographer, you have to balance your subject items and the overall scene to put together a pleasing infrared image and choose the correct infrared filter for that scene. People. Hmm, what can I say? They're either great or they're really scary. Now, let's talk about the plants. Uh, um, well, let's, before that, let's talk about weddings. Uh, for those of you who want to shoot um, portrait photography, infrared is big business. Um, you can charge anything you want for infrareds because it's novel on the wedding scene and it's very, very popular. Um, but for that, you have to know that infrared sees through several layers of our skin. For younger people, this provides a very pleasing image that takes on a glow, promotes beauty, and fortunately sales. For older people, this will show any imperfection, but we're gonna show, I'm going to show you those in a few minutes. Um, I am going to give you a warning. Um, I don't have any R-rated or, or nude pictures, um, but we're going to get close to nudity with scantily dressed people to show how badly infrared can fail in people. Um, that is coming up. Uh, but for wildlife, I mean, look at this. The, the birds, they're just lifeless. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe you like them, but boy, I sure don't. Okay. Here's an image of a, of a shrimp boat called the Poor Boy. Now, Poor Boy was written in different colors, red and blue. And see how the infrared changed the colors around? Okay. Yes, I have a bird here, uh, but it's so small in the scene, it hardly matters. But the overall effect of this image is, is, is it pops. So things that we're going to look for in infrared scenes, we're going to go through that. Um, but before we do, I want to talk about the human body. Um, infrared can see through your skin. Um, some people, it will go deep enough through your skin to pick out your veins and the veins will turn dark, okay? Sometimes you can get really good infrared people shots. Uh, here's an example of a good one. Now, her hair is red. That means her hair was blue in life. It was tinted blue. Uh, her skin is nice. It's soft. Uh, there's no imperfections. It worked very well, didn't it? Sometimes people look like plastic. Uh, look at this model. She almost, except for her eyes and her teeth, looks like a mannequin. Um, it does this to some people. And then we have zombie girl. Uh, this is an example of a person that has a very thin skin and the infrared picks up the veins underneath her skin. Believe it or not, this can be very artsy-fartsy, and a lot of portraits are done this way, okay? Um, I personally see it out of maybe one out of every ten infrared portrait shots. But it can see through your skin, and sometimes it can see totally through your skin, and you get an image like this. 
You know, you just never know when you're shooting people what kind of infrared image you're going to end up with. Yeah, I know. I have a strange sense of humor. Plants and water. This is the bread and potatoes, the meat and potatoes of uh, infrared photography. Okay. Here we can see that the leaves on the trees uh, have a tendency to photograph white, which is good. The limbs and trucks are dark. Um, it can make for a stunning image. Um, see how this, the blue sky turned almost black? But yet, we get a depth of the infrared image showing through the subject that draws us into it. But if you add water to a scene, you get a much more interesting image. Now, this was 830 nanometers. This is deep contrast infrared. Notice the, the white bloom in the plants. Um, this is that wood effect. A great tonality in the leaves. A very deep image, but look at the, the it just rain. This was just a puddle of water on the sidewalk. Um, but by adding that puddle and the reflection, it gives us one of our three legs of a good infrared image. Water reflection. The second leg is plants. Okay. And then there's the sky. The sky is going to be the most dramatic element of any infrared image. Now, this first image, this is an example of that solid gray. I mean, there wasn't a bit of texture in the sky whatsoever. But if you look, we have dark tones, light tones, dark tones, light tones, dark tones, light tones. The infrared energy will actually go through deeper into the cloud structure and bring out more detail. Okay? Um, this is an example of the, the infrared tripod. It has all three elements of a great infrared image the plant leaves, the water reflection, and then the clouds in the sky. If you can build all three of those elements into every image that you take, you're going to be guaranteed a world-class infrared image. Okay? Um, this one was 720 nanometers. Now, there are some problems that you have to overcome in infrared photography. First of all, we get low in-camera contrast. This you can help by putting a polarizing filter on your lens. Now, a polarizing filter will not polarize infrared energy because it looks almost transparent to infrared. If you look at uh, a polarizing filter, hold it up in front of your infrared camera while you're looking at it, the infrared camera will see just clear glass. All right? But a polarizing filter will add contrast. It'll make the blacks a little blacker. High ISO generated noise is also a problem. It's less of a problem now because most infrared cameras now are more modern cameras that do better at high ISO. Low subject contrast, we fix that in post-processing. Camera meter issues, 590 to 665. I'll talk about this now, but we'll talk about that again later. 590 nanometers. Remember I said infrared started at 700 nanometers? 590 is, is deep red, but it's in the visible range. The camera metering system is built in modern cameras to see visible light. And if you have a mixture of visible light and infrared light striking the, the meter sensor inside the camera, it's going to give priority um, to the, um, uh, the deep red. So you have to be careful. Um, you have to pay attention to your, your RGB histogram. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. White balance. This is, this is probably the most single important thing that you have to master in an infrared camera. 
you cannot use an auto white balance. You have to do a custom white balance for every single infrared band except for super blue. You do a custom white balance on green grass or green leaves. All right, and when you have a good white balance, the picture in camera, the sky takes on a bronze color. The, the um, leaves are monochromatic with a blue cast. Having those two things tells you that you have a good white balance. And lastly, your artistic vision. You have to go shoot infrared to get used to what it is the camera is going to capture. Pretty soon you'll be able to look at a scene and envision it in infrared, and then you know that you've become a master at it. And lastly, this is really addictive. Uh, it makes me very, very happy to help you guys along with this addiction. Uh, I don't want to cure you, okay? Things that make IR addictive. Uh, these are the infrared se secrets. Vistas. Oh, my goodness. Vistas are stunning in infrared. Sky, plants, and water. Cloudy overcast skies. Infrared sees into them and gives more detail. If you're shooting black and white, oh, my goodness. Expect to be blown away. Water. Love infrared reflections in the water. Plants and trees. Oh, baby, oh, baby. Long exposures. Yes, infrared cameras work really good in long exposures, especially from 720 up to 850 nanometers. Oh, my goodness. You haven't lived till you've seen an infrared image of a pier uh, for a minute or two in a long exposure and you can shoot all day you don't have to go in the middle of the day during that bright light so how do you start well there are three companies Kalari Vision um, they're in Pennsylvania and they have they offer more conversions than most other companies and their prices are much less if you call them and give them my name, they're going to give you a 15% discount on your order, too. LDP is called MaxMax.com. Um, they're, they're in New Jersey. They're close, they're fast, they're reliable. Um, I have a 720 nanometer uh, Fuji X-Pro1 camera that they put the 720 filter in and it bleeds a little visible light through and I get the most amazing 720 nanometer images out of that camera. Uh, they're a little bit more expensive um, but they're worth it. Life Pixel out on the, um, the left coast um, they have a very large following, but they're a little slower in their conversion process, but they do run sales from time to time. Okay? So they are also good. There's other ones out there, Spencer's camera, and there's there's a, um, system, camera converters overseas. So there's lots, but these are the three biggies. Now I do all of my work at Kalari. Uh, they offer an amazing latitude of, of options. Um, then you have to decide on a, a camera system. Um, my first digital infrared was a Canon 5D. I hated that camera with a passion. I bought it to do color landscapes, thinking I'd do panoramas with it. But at the same time, I was shooting a, um, a 1DS Mark III. And uh, the 5D just didn't have the functionality that my 1DS had. And it just sat on a shelf for a year or two. And finally, I set it off and had it converted. And uh, that was the start of 24 converted cameras. Um, the 5D is a good camera for IR. Okay. I've used almost all of the Micro Four Thirds cameras. 
uh, from Panasonic and Olympus, and they all did great in infrared. Um, now I'm stuck on the Fuji, the Fuji X cameras. I think they make the best infrared camera uh, for the money. Um, I, I think the Fuji X-T1, the X-Pro1, and the X-100S um, make really, really fabulous cameras. Okay. Web resources. These are my web pages. Uh, the Mark Hilliard Adelaire.blog is my main teaching blog, and it incorporates infrared, color, and film. Infrared Adelaire.wordpress.com, that's an IR blog. I have stopped updating it because now when I do infrared posts, I'm doing them on my other blog. But there are hundreds of posts here, and everything you ever wanted to know about infrared, you will find there. Infrared Adelaire.wordpress.com. And then finally, I have my main site Mark Hilliard Adelaire.com workshops excursions um, my main galleries my online galleries are here okay and that pretty much should end this presentation so let's stop this let's jump back and stop the screen sharing and let's ask for questions yeah, I'm sure you have a few now. No? <laughs> Burned you out, Sherry? Oh, I stayed almost. Okay. Actually, I left for a few minutes and made popcorn and came back and ate it. So. Okay, that works for me. Thinking so, I wasn't going to get hooked, but I'm hooked. What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> So I'm waiting for you to send me a camera, one of your older ones. Oh, I've sold them all off or given them all away now. I'm um, down to two cameras now. Well, I was hoping you'd send one. Yeah, and my loader, play with it for a minute. my loader is currently out to a girl up in New Jersey. Uh, but I expect that back here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, someone in New Jersey? Yes. Wow. Another one, huh? Yeah, she's one of my regular um, workshop attendees. And uh, during our last workshop, I told her not to wade through the stream in girly shoes, but she did. And she took a fall and uh, submerged all of her infrared cameras, every single one of them, and destroyed them. Ooh. So I felt sorry for her. I, I let her borrow an infrared camera for a few months. And now she's hooked. Oh, she was hooked before. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, anybody else have any questions? Yeah, so if I really like the gold, the deep gold plants for the 590, um, but still want to be able to do black and white, I could still get a filter to do 665 and 720. Yes. And then will my black and whites still be okay if I did that? Yes, they will. Okay. Um... And then any other cameras that you could recommend that would be a little less expensive and affordable <laughs> for, you know, for teachers and stuff? Um, <laughs> you could go online and you could get a Fuji X-T1 or X-T2 camera from um, eBay for about two or $300. Okay. They make good infrared. Is um, it a full frame? It, it is an APS-C. Oh. Right. Uh, it, it, it is a, a live view camera. They work very well. They have that uh, that new Fuji X Trans sensor in them instead of a three by three color array. They have a six by six color array. Uh, so they do uh, amazing things with their with the the images. Um, I'm with sorry. That, what was the body again? The Fuji XT1 or XT2. The two is a better body. It has a faster um, uh, computer inside of it, and it has an upgraded sensor. Um, then the, the, the lenses you want would be the Fuji um, X 35-millimeter uh, lens. Buy it used. 
or the 14 millimeter lens. That works very, very good for infrared. And you can buy all of those used on eBay now. Cool. Um, so you're talking $1,000 to get infrared? No, I'm talking about $500 uh, for so a camera. You're talking the camera, you're talking the lenses, and you're talking conversion. Well, you only really need one lens. I find that 99% of the time I shoot right around 35 millimeters. Okay. Okay. So a camera and a lens is going to cost you about $400. And the conversion is going to be about $200 um, at uh, Kalari. I'm, I'm sorry. Are you saying XT or XE? XE1, XE2. Okay. He is an Edward? Yes. Yes. Because uh, KH also is a good place for used gear, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay, and then you also want the, the, the Fuji 35 millimeter lens. I heard that part. I just thought you'd said T instead of E. Because, um, face it, most of the time you're going to be using your infrared camera for landscapes. And if you need really, really wide, um, you can... Uh, I go with the 14 millimeter lens, mm -hmm. um, but every camera lens on the market uh, has a uh, an adapter for the Fuji X cameras. So, for Sherry, all of your Leica glass, you can put on the uh, the Fuji body, and it works really, really good. Okay, then I can just sell the 5D too. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you're going to do that, I would go with the X-T1. Just trade it. Yes. <laughs> Just confuse me. <laughs> yeah, the, the X-T1 is Fuji's newest size, and it, it is a better camera than the X-E2. Okay, so the 35 millimeter Fuji 1.4 is 449 brand new. Yes, but you can find them used for about 200 Okay. And that's the same lens you would shoot on any of the Fuji bodies. Okay, so then I'm going to get an X-T1 now. <laughs> and that one's going to cost you about $900. Yeah, okay. Okay. And then converting um, it. Okay, but it's a lighter camera to carry, too. Yo, it's a tiny, small camera, wonderful body. So that's what I'm, that's the upside of doing this, and I don't have to buy D2D. Yeah. Yep, have that 5 do Mark II, that's, that's a heavy body, heavy glass. Okay. So then you would do a dual spectrum, and then you can add the filters on the front. Yes. Okay. Keeping in mind that the darker filters are going to be expensive. Yeah. So your, your expensive filters are going to be the, the R72 um, for 720. The, the um, 830 nanometer filter is the B, B plus W093. And then the filter to convert it back into color, B plus W486. Can you just... Do a whole little list of all the things we need, and we don't have to. Do I'm going to put a PDF version of this on our on our um, Google Drive. Okay. So you'll have all of this. Okay, eight ninety nine. Yeah. Or or if you if you if you're patient, you can wait for the X T one IR, right? Yes, <laughs> and that's not released that. yet. That might be out right now. I don't know. And it's, that's gonna it be says fun. it's pre-order right now on B&H. For how much? Well, the body is is sixteen ninety nine, but the pro the thing is, you have full spectrum from three eighty to a thousand nanometers. Yeah. And it's so it's all built in. You don't have to have to do anything, but. And then you have to add a lens to the front, so. <laughs> and filters. And and so you have to do filters on. You have to. What kind of filters do you do on that kind of camera? Do you have same, to? Still same as as what we talked about 
Oh, really? Yeah, do that. Okay. Because it because it's full spectrum, so that means. But it said that the range goes all the way up to a thousand. Yeah. Well, you can buy a thousand nanometer filter too. Oh. Okay. Okay. Now, one thing we didn't talk about is post processing for infrared. And that is way, way out of range of this of this introduction. But I have um, two videos in the Grand Library: um, infrared post processing, part one and part two. Okay. That will teach you everything you ever need to know about uh, working in false color and black and white. And then, like I said, you can download. Um, the Photoshop action. It's a plug-in to do the false color uh, swap for you in a very intelligent fashion. Yeah, I watched, I watched those and used them on my uh, ghost town pictures, my infrared, and they're very easy to follow. So. Okay. And they worked out well. <laughs> so, well, we have fun with them. Mm-hmm. Well, that's it for today. I hope that I gave you enough information to think uh, logically about this. Mm -hmm. um, I have great passion for infrared photography. Mm -hmm. uh, my, one of my Sphere 2 programs is going to be on infrared. Um, now, that being said, I also shoot infrared film. Yes, you can buy infrared film for 35 millimeter and 120 and 4 by 5 inch film. It's made from a company called Rolly, R-O-L-L-E-I, and it's called IR400, and it shoots 720 nanometers. If you put a 720 nanometer filter on the, the lens, you get 720 nanometer out of the film. If you take the filter off, you get a film that looks very much like Tri-X. Okay, um, but that's the subject for another day also, should you have uh, questions about film. And I somehow doubt I'll see much of that. <laughs> so right. you, you said the, the plug-in for Photoshop is on your, on your educational blog or on your regular website? It's on my regular, it's the markhilliardadelaire-blog.com. Okay. And it's on the main page. It's the there's a, a right hand menu. It's at the bottom of the right hand menu. There's a oh, down the click to download. I see it now. Okay. And then you just install it in your actions menu. It's the Chrome Chrome Chromography. Chromography. Okay, sorry. Okay. Thank you. And I discuss it in great depth, nauseating detail in the videos. Okay. Okay, and we, I talk about uh, um, raw converters because the Adobe ACR raw converter has a problem with lots of different infrared cameras. And it decides it doesn't like the custom white balance you gave it, and it'll default out to uh, 5,000 degrees Kelvin, and your images come out bright red. Oh. Uh, but there's a workaround for that in ACR that's very easy also. Um, but those are all things that we'll discuss at a later time, or you can watch uh, my two videos. Okay. Cool. Oh, my. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I hope that that answered questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Let me stop the broadcast. Thank you.